If this dirt could talk, man, it could tell you some stories. If this dirt could talk, you probably wouldn't believe it. But it happened. It was real. There are only a few who are still left to tell about it. We'll share their stories, so just maybe they'll be remembered and their heritage is not lost like dust in the wind. Jefferson Davis was born in Missouri. They were neighbors with the James boys, Jesse James and his brother, and my grandfather that was sad to leave. But they followed down to uh, San Marcos and settled down there. And my great-grandfather grew up around San Marcos and his family farm, but he didn't want a farm. He thought he wanted to be a rancher. So he bought a hundred head of longhorn heifers and took two horses and two saddles and drove them from San Marcos. Ran on to a guy in, in Abilene that told him he had a place for him and he'd uh, uh, trade it to him for one of the horses and the saddle. Well, when he got out here, the place didn't exist. This was all state on land and leased. In 1887, they formed Stonewall County, and so he homesteaded right here and started opening up banks. And Granddad was born August 1st, 1900. He left the ranch twice, I believe. He was born at this house, and he died at the same house. The original ranch probably 20 sections and my grandfather added more until it was up to at the highest peak is 36 sections. After I got hurt in football I drove home. I drove up and he said what are you doing here boy? He said you go back and go to college. I said no granddad I don't want to. He said I'd rather come here and work. He said well I'm not hired. You go back I'll help you finish out school. So I turned around and went back. That's the biggest mistake I ever made in my life. I didn't get a degree until July or August of 70. But I, you know, I came back here and went to work and they fixed up that house, our house down there. It wasn't very big, but grandmother made it comfortable. And put some furniture in it and beds and stuff so it it was pretty good. I'd go up and eat breakfast with my grandparents, and then I'd go out and catch a bronc, and get him saddled, and go catch another one, put a halter and a lead rope on. I'd leave out about 6.30 in the morning, so I'd tie that bronc up and then prowl the west side of that kind of country, and then come back and eat a bite of lunch. Grandmother packed me up with sausage biscuits. She put uh, wild plum jelly on it. And I'd take about a 10 minute nap. I'd get the other horse saddled up. With, then I'd take off and go back to the prowl the east side, and come back to the house. But that's what I did six days a week, was ride horses. One story, I got off my horse, and sure enough, it was a rattlesnake. It was about that big, and he was just twisting. Mad, I'm sure. Anyway, I broke off a limb and poked him in the head, and all of a sudden I got to looking and thought, there's one that big, I bet there's 20 or 30, and mama. I mean, so I got on my horse and got out of there. The cows started trying to get away, and I fell off the side of one of those cliffs and going down trying to head those cattle and push and brush away like this. And all of a sudden I looked up and here's a limb this big around right here. I grabbed it, I grabbed it with both hands. Cut, cut, kick, crash. Fell it out. Went to looking for that horse and he's standing down there crazy and looking at me. He said, what are you doing? <laughs> broke the, one of Alice Daniels' bulls. He broke away from the herd and he was running down that hill. And I caught him. He was a 1,200, 1,400 pound bull. And I was riding a little horse. And I don't dally. Never had, never could. So I was tied on, and I reached out and caught up through a big loop, and I caught that bull. But fortunately for me, he put one foot through it, and then it was around here. So I, he couldn't do anything. And that bull would jump, and that horse would go. He couldn't hold it. But we sat there for about 30, 40 minutes before the cowboys came out, and 
I'm trying to get the gate shut when that bull turns around and runs and hits the gate and then hits my horse. The bull saw me and he hit me. I'm trying to crawl and he is just, he broke several ribs. My little, little brother saved my life. None of, the, none of the cowboys got him to help. My last horse was Rojo. He's buried out there. A good friend of mine is from Austin. He was needing to sell some cattle. So we went down there and spent a week getting those heifers sorted. Anyway, uh, we got ready to leave. Bob comes walking up, had Rojo the halter, and he loaded him in my trailer. <laughs> Everybody loved that stupid horse. I remember taking them out and staking them out here in the, in the front. By staking them, they had a rock, a big rock, and tie a halter onto them. And they'd have to drag that. If they wanted to go anywhere, they had to drag that rock. But it was just to teach them how to hold. He had a bad habit not picking his feet up. Got out one morning and took him over to those two deep canyons. They run the length of that pasture section. And I'd go down one side, go back up, move 10 yards, go down the other side. And he got where he never stumbled. He was, he was probably the best outside horse that I've ever ridden. My great-grandfather, Brandon, had an A on the shoulder, the side, and the thigh. And then he did a seven under bit and an over bit in both ears. So he just had about that much ear sticking out. Kansas City, those old Dutchmen walking by and say, branded all over and the ears cut off. 15, 16 years ago, I was having trouble finding hands. I had the bright idea that we'd just get a helicopter. So I got a guy out at Snyder to come over. He gathered all the cattle in a matter of four or five hours, we quit gathering pastures, we used a helicopter. Still good. We'd uh, brand in May, but we'd rope and drag them. We could brand 100 calves in, you know, two hours. Around the 4th of July, we worked out. You know, that's the hardest working I've ever done in my life. Go to Stanford party until two o'clock in the morning, come over and have to get up at five to work. That wasn't any fun. <laughs> Granddad had an uncle, we called him Uncle Jasper, and he was a blacksmith. He didn't have a welder. Back then, it was forged. You know, everything he did was forged. And he had his own shop out there, an old wooden barn. But he, was a, he was a hell of a craftsman. He made all the hinges, built all the gates, and uh, he'd get the boys you know, the hands to come help him put the gate close to where he wanted to set it and then he'd kick them all out and he'd swing the gate by himself. It's amazing what that old man could do. He had a pat race with snake. Granddaddy said he was stepping up to get in the blacksmith shop and here a mouse came running between his legs and that snake did too and caught that mouse. And that was his pet. He kept the whole rump mice out. My grandparents just, they cared about so many people and did so much. A lot of people remember him think highly of them, so that's a good thing. Everybody called Grandmother Aunt Beta. They called Granddaddy J.D. <laughs> he wanted to have uncle to anybody. <laughs> my grandmother was a petite lady. My grandfather was, he was a bulky man, 5'11", weighed 240 pounds, but he cooked on this table. He cooked nearly every meal, but he would uh, feed all the cowboys. It was hard times back then. Back in the 30s, the schools started closing down. A lot of kids came out here and lived in the bunkhouse, and grandmother and granddad would cook and feed them. It's just something that's got to be in, in your heart, in your mind, because uh, it's not an easy way to make a living. When I was young, he'd write me letters and tell me what's going on at the ranch and what have you. Because, you know, this is this where I wanted to be all my life. My granddad put a hundred steers on that seven diamond elk pasture. He took them off for wheat and on that on the weeds they gained three pounds a day just on weeds. When we had cattle in the lots if you had a problem the wind wasn't blowing you needed water well they built that pool it's 
five foot deep and uh, pump the water from the windmill straight in there and then the pipe under it would take it to the lots. That's where my granddad taught me how to swim. Threw me in the water. <laughs> After we'd eaten, granddad would go in there and start washing dishes and then everybody else had to start helping. So I was official dish dryer. And he used to tell me this was a fourth generation. The boy said, you're gonna lose it. I said, it's just the history of it. The first one puts it together, the second one adds to it, the third one loses it. There wasn't any wood. And it wasn't near the canyons that they are now. It used to be when they, those guys settled out here, you know, grass was boot top tall and clean, you couldn't see anything. The hardest thing I probably ever did was selling that seven section, you know. But I'm out of debt, don't owe anybody anything, got money in the bank. I, I don't have to complain about anything. It was a good decision, good for myself and both my brothers, because everybody's comfortable now and nobody has to worry about anything. So. That's a good thing. As I told you, the only time a rancher makes any money is when he sells his place. The only way to get out of that investment back is you put a lot in. I love where I live. I've traveled to Europe, I've traveled everywhere. They don't speak Texan. You know, I just soon stay around the ranch. I can walk out my door and say anything I want. I can shoot at anything I want. Not bothering anybody but me. If you're out here at night, Lay down and look up and look at the stars. It's unbelievable what the stars look like out here. <laughs>